Welcome to this episode of the Engineering Quality Control Podcast, a podcast focused on helping engineering professionals ensure their projects are of the highest quality. The goal of the show is to provide strategies and concepts to help ensure that you can address quality control on all of your projects. I am your host, Brian Wagner, licensed professional engineer, and in this episode of the Engineering Quality Control Podcast, I'm going to do a little bit of a review of the I-35W bridge collapse that occurred on August 1st, 2007 in Mississippi, where almost a thousand feet of bridge fell in to the river. We'll be talking about some of the causes, and some of the effects of work that was done in the 1960s had on society in the 2010. So please note that this is meant to be for educational purposes and none of the information should be relied upon and utilized for any other reason. So let's jump right in. So today I want to talk about the I-35W bridge collapse that occurred in August 2007. And I'm going to read the uh, synopsis that was published by the National Transportation Safety Board in their report after the accident. So at about 6.05 p.m. Central Daylight Time on Wednesday, August 1st, 2007, the eight-lane, 1,900-foot-long i 35W highway bridge over the Mississippi River in Minneapolis, Minnesota, experienced a catastrophic failure in the main span of the deck truss. As a result, a thousand feet of deck truss collapsed, with about 456 feet of the main span falling 108 feet into 15 feet deep water. A total of 111 vehicles were on that portion of the bridge when it collapsed and of the 17 were recovered from the water. As a result of the bridge collapse, 13 people perished and 145 were injured. Now we bring this up on the Quality Control Podcast because I first learned about this incident from uh, several years ago in an ethics seminar. And it was talking about the investigation that happened afterwards And since then, I've done some research on it to understand more about what happened. And the moral of the story is that basically there was a design error that was never captured and caught in the 1960s. And some 40 years later, a catastrophic failure caused the bridge to collapse. Now, there's many factors that went into the collapse itself because it was more than just that single design failure. But it just kind of reminds us all that the work that we do as engineers and as professionals has the potential to be a very lasting impact on society and on people. And so today I want to dive into a little bit of the the things that happened in the accident and a little bit of the information that I've been able to find and understand and have learned about the incident and how hopefully that it can help each of you think about things just a little bit differently. So on the day of the collapse, there was road work being done on the bridge and the contractor had stacked a significant amount of materials on the bridge. And I don't think it was ever intentional or ever nobody ever questioned the capacity or the ability of the bridge to carry that load but it seems that the positioning of it didn't help anything and that it overloaded a gusset plate and caused uh, the gusset plate to fracture and when it failed this bridge like many other bridges in the United States is fracture critical that's not a term I've really ever heard before but it makes complete sense so a bridge such as this and of the some eight to 20,000 others across the United States that are considered fracture critical, when one component fails, when one aspect of that bridge fails, there's no security, there's no safety blanket, there's no uh, factor of safety in there, the entire thing will fail. And when we talk about trusses, we talk about other structural components and I am by no means a structural expert, 
I am by no means, uh, I don't think I'm an expert on this accident. I've done a few hours of research and really kind of tried to wrap my head around what happened. And I would encourage you, if you want to learn more about it, there is a ton of resources on the internet and YouTube. This year, 2022, is the 15-year anniversary. So I've seen several things come out from different associations and agencies about lessons learned and things that we can take away from this incident. And I, and I think it's important that I share it as part of this podcast because we do our work, we do our design. When you look at the design side, not necessarily the execution side, but the design side of, of engineering, and we're producing a product that is then used to construct or make other decisions for our clients. How often does anybody go back unless there is a question or an issue during construction and really question the work. Do you ever go back and re-review your work after it's built? Not really. And that's kind of what happened here. So for 40 years, this bridge stood and it was classified as very poor condition leading up to when it collapsed. There was even an inspection that had found that gusset plates were beginning to bow and not in their position. And, and the, the factor that caused the failure of, of, was an underdesigned gusset plate where the beams come together and the rivets were, it should have been one inch thick, but it was designed to be a half inch. And that wasn't captured on any of the, it wasn't captured in the initial design as an error. And even when there was noticeable bowing and issues with at least one set of gusset plates, nobody went back to the original design, as far as I could find, and questioned whether or not it was designed correctly. They just noted that that needed to be addressed. There was also a problem with one of the rollers. So a bridge like that has to expand. It has to be able to move with the thermal variations. And my understanding is that at least one of those roller units had seized because of corrosion and that they attribute the failure to the gusset plates failure, but also to the fact that the bridge couldn't move as it was designed because of lack of maintenance. And as a result, catastrophic failure that ultimately killed 13 people. Even when I watched a few of the documentaries and some of the information that you can find and listen to the stories of the people that were involved, the people that ended up in the water submerged and unable to get out of their vehicles, or that were able to get out of their vehicles and be able to get themselves to relative safety, and the hundreds of passerbys that stopped and helped. The rescue operation took about 81 minutes, and then it became a recovery operation. And even today, 15 years later, there's still people that are reeling from this incident. And it's all the result, ultimately, of a design error in the 1960s. So don't think that any of the work that we do on any of the projects that we have cannot have a lasting impact, albeit that this is a very negative impact. And like I said, I'm not a structural, so I, I'm not a person that really understands how gusset plates are designed or what those quality control checks are in your design process. But I would encourage each of you, think about how you check plans, how you validate the information that you're signing and sealing or that you're producing at the end of the day and consider the risk. It's came up several times in this podcast and other episodes with other uh, guests. And we talk about risk and we often associate that with financial risk, financial impacts of having to tap into that liability and professional uh, liability insurance that as long as we're not doing things negligently, oh, it was just an error or an omission that the insurance will help get us through that, right? And we look at risk from a perspective of needing to manage that because we don't want to have our insurance premiums increase. But risk in engineering is a lot more than just the financial risk to you and me. It's the financial risk to the agencies and to the public infrastructure and the public individuals that use the resource and the work that we do. 
I was in a leadership program several years ago, and one of the challenges they had when they, we introduced everybody to each other, we talked about describe what you do without saying what you do. And I don't remember exactly what I said, but I said something about that each of you traveled on something that I would have worked on because as a civil, we do roads, we do subdivisions, we do all those things. And that the infrastructure that people use every day is directly the result of the work that I've done and that we do across the industry. So it's more than just producing that product. We're doing good. We're doing things for the world. And when something happens like this, even 40 years later, the blame has to land somewhere. And in this case, it ended up at the design engineer who had been purchased at least once, maybe twice. So the company that had bought that company. So they assumed liability in their acquisition that they didn't even necessarily know they were acquiring. But suits had have settled with them. And there's also been suits against the inspecting company that didn't maybe didn't throw up enough red flags, didn't make enough things warned enough people or make a big enough deal. There, there's also been reviews of how the government and how different agencies handle information. And it comes back to the, the failing infrastructure or the potential for failing infrastructure where there's deficiencies in the availability of money, funding. And that one of the great quotes that I did hear on one of the documentaries that I did watch was, and I'll paraphrase it, but it was basically that the federal government cares a lot more about a crack in an engine on an airplane than they may care about a crack on a bridge. And I don't think that's completely true, but it comes back to funding and where those efforts and what things, yes, it can be this new and beautiful project that's going to save flooding or save damage or deal with there's just so many things in this world that we have lapsed on honestly and maybe need to do a little bit better job but it still comes back to those design engineers and those people that are producing that work and i want to make sure that that i stress that we're all responsible for our own work obvious and it doesn't have to just be bridges i've had the unfortunate experience myself of dealing with a few issues with some proprietary stormwater products. I'm not going to name it by name because I think that they can be really good products. But in my experience, I had two underground systems that I've been directly involved with or had had input in or uh, contributed to that failed, that collapsed. No dam well, there was some property damage, no damage to anybody's personal vehicles or even and no injuries or loss of life to casualties. But it was a real pain in the butt. In the first case, we nobody really knows what happened. Uh, but we suspect that there was overloading of that product after it had been installed in the backfill process. We suspect that it was probably overloaded. And then with time, after the site was completed, the static load caused the system to collapse and the paving to sink. Almost at the same time, there was another system of a, I believe a different product, but a similar product that also failed. And my understanding with that one was it was essentially like a house of cards. And I believe after learning about the bridge collapse and, and the terminology of fracture critical, I think this system also could be considered something along those lines that when a portion of it fails, the entire house of cards falls down. And in the second case, it when they, they vac trucked the dirt away from it because they wanted to know why it had failed and come to find out it was what they believe was a electrical conduit had been directionally bored had penetrated the system inadvertently no fault of anybody necessarily purposefully there was definitely no negligence as far as i know but that that penetration caused a portion of the system and its integrity to fail well when it did, it was like a house of cards. So the entire system failed and it collapsed on itself. All the result of a very minor, what would you would think would be a very minor catastrophe or uh, compromise, I should say. So while we talked about bridges, we talk about those stormwater products, it's anything that we do. Pipes, culverts, 
horizontal and vertical designs, grading, all of that, the work in the civil site world can have inverse of adverse effects in the future. Do we meet ADA compliance? And the same can be true with, with building engineering, structural design. Each and every one of those aspects are so important in the long term. We just, I want to bring some of these things to the forefront, bring them to your attention, encourage you to find and do some research so that you can make decisions in the best interest of yourself and your company, but also your client and the project. So I don't necessarily have a specific power of experience kind of segment today, but I do want to mention this, and that is that had I realized in my world of the civil and land development side of things with uh, using these different proprietary programs and, and or products and soft and installing different things that are new and innovative and great and they are there are a lot of things that have their place have their have their use i would just encourage you pay attention make sure no matter what the product is concrete plastic metal Whatever innovative thing or new thing or whatever becomes that new hot thing, do your research. Make sure you understand and really wrap your head around what the implications can be in the long term. The what ifs, the whys, and really evaluate those things in your process so that you can produce that best product and do the best work and minimize that risk in the long term. I'm sure the designer that designed those gusset plates never intended for that bridge to collapse, but it did. So as I wrap up today's episode, please remember that you can find the show notes for this episode at engineeringqualitycontrol.com. Find a summary of the points that we've discussed along with links to other resources and other information about both the bridge collapse and an example of another site that had its stormwater system fail, cause damage to a parking lot. Until next time, friends, I wish you the best in all of your engineering endeavors.